Welcome back to Mafia. And in this Audio Boom original podcast series, we explore America's criminal underworld to reveal the lives and careers of its greatest gangsters. Our sponsor for this episode of Mafia is Hymns. Ben Siegel wasn't a make pretend tough guy, he was an out and out killer. He was driven by power, money, status, and sex. Bugsy Siegel is an American mob legend. He's the guy who dreamt up Las Vegas. He put the glitz and glamour into Sin City. This is Mafia. Benjamin Bugsy Siegel grew up in Brooklyn and by a young age had already developed a reputation for violence and a flair for making a buck through theft and extortion. He was desperate to prove himself, but in the 1920s, opportunities for Jewish hoodlums were severely limited. Ernest Volkman, author of Gangbangers. You had very strict divisions between the various ethnic gangs. Jews didn't even go into Italian neighborhoods. Italians didn't even go into Jewish neighborhoods, much less cooperate on crime. But in 1929, the world opened up for young Siegel when an up-and-coming Italian-American mastermind, Charles Lucky Luciano, realized that segregation of the different ethnic criminal groups was bad for business. Here was Luciano saying, we're going to cooperate. I don't care if he's Jewish. He doesn't care if I'm Italian. Guess what? See this dollar bill here? Okay, does that look Jewish or Italian to you? It's pretty neutral, right? That was his point. If you, if you organize and you put it on a business-like basis, who the hell cares what you are? It doesn't, doesn't make any difference. That whole distinction doesn't make any sense anymore. A true capitalist doesn't care about race or religion. Eric Desenhall, author of The Devil Himself. And Luciano recognized that if you keep the rackets just to Italians, you cut out a lot of great earners. into extreme poverty. Ben was born, uh, his real name is uh, Siegelbaum, and he came from a very, very poor uh, family among the way of a very, very poor Eastern European Jews who settled in Brooklyn and lower Manhattan. And like, unfortunately, some other kids in that immigrant milieu decided um, Honest living was not the way out. Wanted more than that. So he became a petty criminal. Uh, he had a very close friend, a small little guy named Mo Sedway, who later would play a very important role in Siegel's life. They emigrated over to the Lower East Side where he met up with another little small Jewish kid named Meyerhold Sudrichowski, who later changed his name to Meyer Lansky. And for some odd reason, nobody ever quite figured out why they headed off immediately. Uh, although they were very two different kinds of people. Uh, ben was, uh, even then, violent. Uh, able, uh, just erupt in violence at any, any given moment. Maya was the much more thoughtful kid. Uh, even though, like Ben, he had never gotten past the sixth grade. But meanwhile, he and Ben, they decided to go into business together, and they formed an outfit they called the Bugs Meyer Mob. Siegel established his reputation as a street criminal at the age of 14. And what he did was he approached pushcart peddlers, which all the Lower East Side was, that was, there were no department stores or anything. Every business was done out of pushcarts. And they went up to the pushcart owners and he said, you need fire insurance. They said, what? Fire insurance. Get out of here. I don't need fire insurance. He said, okay. So that very night, after the push carts had been put away for the night, would you believe it? Fire broke out. And the man's push cart broke up. Incredibly, somebody had poured kerosene over them and set them alight. But they got the message. And they then paid $1 per week per push cart to this 14-year-old street punk named Ben Siegel. But it established him as a uh, uh, Eastside criminal, 
Let's put it that way. Uh, he was not the only East Side criminal. There was plenty of other kids involved in uh, those kinds of activities. But he was a guy who very early established that this is somebody who's a bad seed. It's that simple. Now, the bugs came from the fact that friends of Siegel began to say, you know, he's crazy as a bed bug, which got shortened to Bugsy. Now, Bugsy was meant as an affectionate little name, you know, like you say, Muggsy and Bugsy. Uh, ben didn't see it that way. And for the rest of his life, you called him Bugsy to his face at your peril. Uh, he would kill you. Together, Siegel and Lansky were now making good money. Now, the Bugs Meyer mob was, was percolating along. Prohibition helped them because now suddenly this gang of petty thieves, which is what they were fundamentally, suddenly could start making real money by running uh, beer runs, by hijacking trucks. Uh, they hired themselves out often as shotgun on major liquor shipments. And then Lansky, in the first of his great innovative criminal ideas, came up with a beauty. He said, hmm, you know, these people who get into the bootleg business, they got a problem. They can, they can need trucks and cars to move this stuff. Trucks and cars are expensive. Ah. So they started a rent-a-car business. If you were into the business, you could go to Meyer and Siegel and rent a truck for a certain amount of money a day. This is thus the predecessor of Avis and Hertz and all the rest of them. Now, the virtue of that from, the, from Siegel's and Lansky's standpoint is that the overhead was quite low. Why? Because they stole all these vehicles. They would steal them and then rent them out. Beautiful. More after a word from our sponsor. Did you know that over 25% of new cases of erectile dysfunction are diagnosed in guys under 40 years old? Or that 40% of men by the age of 40 struggle to get and maintain an erection? Maybe you don't care about the statistics, but you should care about your own health and wellness. So why haven't you taken the necessary steps to address your ED? Because the whole situation is awkward and embarrassing? Because none of the snake oil pills or over-the-counter supplements you've tried in the past seem to help? Well, I'm asking you not to give up just yet. I want you to try 4 It's the one-stop shop for hair loss, skin care, and sexual wellness for men, and it's got science-based solutions to help you now. Go to 4 and get connected with real doctors and medical-grade solutions to treat your ED. You'll get well-known generic equivalents to name-brand prescriptions, and you won't have to deal with long waits in a doctor's office because 4 lets you talk with a doctor online. You just have to answer a few quick questions. You know, being your best means performing your best, and you can get started today. Try Hymns for a month for just $5. We'll get you started for just five bucks while supplies last. See website for details. Go to forhims.com slash mafia ed. That's F O R H I M S dot com slash M A F I A E D. Forhims.com slash mafia ed. It was around this time that Bugsy's friend, Meyer Lansky, met Charles Lucky Luciano. Famously, Luciano tried to shake him down, and Meyer told him uh, in no uncertain terms, in very colorful language, where he could get off. You think that because I'm Jewish, I'm just going to fork over money. That's not going to happen today, buddy. Meyer Lansky's defiance immediately won Luciano's respect. It was the start of a very special relationship. Lansky and uh, Luciano became extremely close friends and they turn out to have the most devastating criminal partnership in American history. Journalist and historian Douglas Valentine. Through that partnership and the associations that um, they each brought to this partnership, um, modern organized crime was born. They, they saw that they could work together, Italians, Jews, um, Irishmen, that they could um, find um, uh, people who would collude with them, politicians in particular, uh, union people. Um, uh, and they were constantly reaching out for new ways to expand this organization. With his multi-ethnic gang, Luciano blazed a bloody trail to the top of the underworld. 
journalist Diana Blass. Lucky Luciano was the ultimate mob boss. He was ruthless. Uh, he knew what he wanted. And he wasn't afraid to go after it. He was known as this racketeering tycoon, and he ran a huge prostitution ring. He was the ultimate pimp. He didn't care who got in his way because he'd just kill him and <laughs> move on up that ladder. Lucky Luciano was powerful. Nobody messed with him because if you did, you'd end up dead. Bugsy rose through Luciano's ranks quickly, standing out from the usual criminal thugs. As Lansky rose, Ben Siegel rose. People who knew him all say the same thing. You could sit with Ben, he was charming, he had conversation, you couldn't find a, a more funny guy to be around, just great. Lansky regarded, uh, uh, well, Lansky was regarded as the brains, and Siegel always was regarded as the brawn. Okay, Lansky was the guy who came up with the ideas, and Siegel was the guy who would carry them out. Uh, somebody had to be slugged, something had to be stolen, whatever. That's a little bit of an oversimplification. It wasn't. It wasn't quite that stark. But the po important fact was, Siegel had now come to the attention of someone as important as Luciano. Before Luciano could take control of the mob he needed to remove two dangerous obstacles that stood in his way. And Bugsy Siegel was the perfect man for the job. The two big people standing in Luciano's way were the bosses Salvatore Maranzano and Joe Miseria. And Luciano was about to unleash Siegel to take them out. That devolved into Siegel's most important assignment to date and the one that really put him on the map in terms of organized crime. And that was the assassination of uh, Joe Masseria in 1931. Siegel was selected as one of the four gunmen. Well, after the murder of uh, Masseria, uh, which has elevated uh, Siegel's status uh, considerably, he's now regarded as uh, Meyer Lansky's chief business partner. Lansky is always promoting him. Lansky is always going to people like Luciano and saying, I got a guy, my friend Ben Siegel, he is terrific. He's a guy you can depend on. Any mission you want, beautiful, fantastic guy. Five months later, Luciano set Bugsy and fellow Jewish mobsters on the final mob boss in his way, Salvatore Maranzano. Carrying that out established Ben Siegel in Luciano's eyes as someone who could be totally relied on. Having wiped out his opposition, Luciano took command. It was a criminal revolution, establishing the modern mafia in America, uniting feuding gangs into a criminal empire powerful enough to thrive and outwit the authorities for decades to come. For his role in making all this possible for Luciano, Ben Siegel was assured a privileged position. Ben Siegel was a tremendous asset to somebody like Luciano. And Luciano was a tremendous asset to somebody like Siegel. He traveled the country, coordinating takeovers of local mobs and rackets. The gangster life suited him to a T. You know, for Ben Siegel, it was all about the display. It was all about the style. It was all about what people thought. And for the approval-hungry Siegel, what better way to impress than with a string of high-class women? Bugsy Siegel had these baby blue eyes. In fact, he was known as Baby Blue Eyes. And he was this playboy mobster. He had this rough edge around him. But he was also irresistible. You know, he, he owned the room when he walked in. And that's what women loved about him. But Siegel never really had any of the great business ideas. It was usually Lansky alone who dreamt up the money-making schemes. All, that is, apart from one. And it happened in 1928. He and Lansky, who had come under the ages of Andre Rothstein, the famous Jewish organized crime king and the model for Maya Wolfshine in The Great Gatsby, he gave them a little assignment. He sent them out to Saratoga, New York, to run a little backroom gambling operation, a little illegal operation, like many they had, okay? And it was okay, it made a few dollars on it. But Lansky and Siegel realized there was something else going on in Saratoga, and that was a much fancier gambling casino. They went into this place and they could not believe what they saw. 
chandeliers, men in tuxedos, women in evening gowns, and money. Tons of money. And at that moment, they both had an epiphany. They both realized that, that was the future. That's where the money is. Forget prohibition. Everybody in crime understood prohibition had a limited lifespan. It was going to end sooner or later. Got to look to the future. What's the future? In these two guys' minds, that beautiful, incredible, illegal casino they saw was the way to go. Now, the problem was, to achieve that dream was absolutely out of their reach at the moment. It would take a tremendous amount of money. It would take a tremendous amount of money for the payoffs to the police and the politicians to keep it going. But it's something they stuck in the back of their minds, and they were determined at some point, you know, they were going to make it happen. On January 28, 1929, Siegel married his childhood sweetheart, Esther Krakauer. They would go on to have two daughters. Ben, because of prohibition, like a lot of other criminals, he was coming into good money for the first time in his life. As a matter of fact, he got married and bought a, a very nice house in a uh, upscale suburb known as Scarsdale, just north of New York City. And for all the world, he was, uh, you know, uh, looked like a very successful man. He was very, paid a lot of a doting attention to his daughters, who he adored. So he spent a lot of time at the new house in uh, Seagull, became something of a suburban gangster, I guess that's the way to phrase it. He, he commuted to work from now on. <laughs> Even after he married uh, Elsa Krakauer, when she was 18 in uh, 1929, almost immediately he took up with every woman he could, he could find. And he never made any secret of that. He just, he liked women, and women liked him. He was a, he was a handsome man. He was probably the best looking racketeer in the country. <laughs> Bugsy wanted to advertise a very simple fact. I am a person of poor immigrant background who has made a success. I've achieved the American dream. But despite his slick outward appearances, by 1937, Bugsy Siegel was a man with a price on his head. Wanted dead by rival gangs. Here was the problem. Bugsy had become a little too notorious. There was a lot of heat in New York. There were gang wars, and he was vulnerable. Chief among his enemies was an East Coast king of the prohibition bootlegging boom, Waxy Gordon. Siegel had murdered six of Waxy's men, and Lansky had tried to frame Waxy. Lansky set him up on, on an IRS charge. Gordon found out about him to make a long, complicated story short. He sent his chief torpedo, one Tony Forpizzo, to kill both Lansky and Siegel, which he attempted to do by lowering a bomb down a chimney in a restaurant where both men liked to eat. The bomb, however, exploded prematurely, blew up the chimney, Bricks hit Siegel in the head, and he had to go to the hospital. Uh, why is that significant? Because while in the hospital, a person came to Tony Fabrizio's house and shot him dead in front of two witnesses, both of whom said, Bugsy Siegel did this. Well, that made no sense, because Bugsy was in the hospital, right? Uh, well, not really. The cops began to sniff around. They began to get the idea that what had happened is that Bugsy had snuck out of the hospital at some point because he lost his temper, because he got so angry that somebody tried to blow him up. Lansky had recommended to Siegel, look, Ben, he'll get his at some point. Don't get crazy. Don't get crazy. If Fabiso gets hit, they know he works for Roxy Gordon and they're going to suspect us right off the bat. You know, don't do it. Siegel didn't listen. Sneaks out of the hospital, shoots the guy in front of two witnesses in broad daylight. Now, he escapes only because, A, the cops can't really make a case. Also because Lansky realizes, I think it's a good idea if we figure for something for, for Ben to do that's not going to get him in so much trouble. New York was getting too hot. And the best thing to do was get out of town. 
after the break. Hey, Mafia fans. If you love this podcast, I'm pretty sure you also enjoy all kinds of other mysteries as well. So let me tell you about a new podcast that I love called Unexplained Mysteries. Every week, the hosts explore the greatest mysteries of past and present, from the building of Stonehenge to the subject of the Mona Lisa. There may not be a simple answer or explanation, but that doesn't mean there's no explanation at all. Each episode takes you on a journey with captivating storytelling. With the help from a team of researchers, the hosts of Unexplained Mysteries dig deep into the bizarre, the strange, or even the everyday events you'd never think to question. You can check out episodes on Mona Lisa and Stonehenge now. Subscribe to hear upcoming episodes on dragons, crop circles, and more every Thursday. Visit Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts and search for Unexplained Mysteries. That's U-N-E-X-P-L-A-I-N-E-D-M-Y-S-T-E-R-I-E-S. Or visit parcast.com slash unexplained to start listening now. That's parcast, P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com slash unexplained to listen now. Luciano wanted to put distance between Bugsy and his rival East Coast mobsters, so he sent him 3,000 miles west to California. So Bugsy came from a poor Jewish family in New York, and he always dreamed of having more. So when he went to California, it was like his dreams are coming true. All these lavish parties, people throwing money around, everyone was pretty much living in La La Land, and Bugsy was happy to join him. But Luciano wasn't just trying to protect Bugsy. Luciano and the New York Mafia have the idea of let's expand operations in California. There's a mafia in California, but it's contemptuously called the Mickey Mouse Mafia by the New York guys, because it is. It's run by an idiot named Jack Jack, and totally weak. And let's go out there and let's expand gambling operations. Why? There's a river of money out there to be tapped. His new mission was to muscle in on the West Coast rackets. Uh, Bugsy had a very simple assignment in California. Uh, Expand operations, uh, particularly into gambling. First item on the agenda, the uh, uh, wire service. What was the wire service? A guy named Jim Reagan had set up a, a brilliant idea. And the brilliant idea, first simply, was this. All the bookies needed were the results from races all over the country. They can't wait. People got to know whether they get paid off or not. So he set up this service in which involved, since telephones are bought at racetracks, guys with binoculars outside the racetracks would watch the tote board. They would telephone the odds, uh, who was participating in the race, and then when the race was over, they would immediately telephone the results. Very profitable. If you were a bookie, you had to subscribe to it. How much it cost you? Anywhere from five to $25,000 a month. Former Beverly Hills detective, Les Zeller. He was sent out to California, Los Angeles, initially, to uh, get into the, the wire service for horse racing. And at the time, Jack Dragna was the head of the wire service, so he had to kind of butt in to that uh, business. The gambling activities in California, which is really what everybody was after, particularly Los Angeles, was nominally under Dragna's control. But Rag- Dragna was weak, and everybody knew it. And so when Chicago and New York made it clear that he, Dragna, was now lo- no longer in charge, but would be regarded as a helpful assistant now. He got the message, and he understood, and happily welcomed Ben. Oh, Ben, how are you? Very wonderful, blah, 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 blah. Meanwhile, I'd like to kill this guy. (laughs) But there's nothing much he could do about it. Bugsy's murderous reputation had preceded him. That was enough to make Dragna hand over control of his operation. And with the wire service, he didn't care that he was stepping on toes of Jack Dragna. He just uh, did what he wanted to do. He just didn't care. Bugsy Siegel was his own man and didn't care about anybody. Bugsy's takeover was soon generating enormous profits for Luciano and the mob. And by 1942, it was raking in some $8 million a year. Before long, Bugsy Siegel was California's most powerful gangster, and the rumors surrounding him captivated Hollywood's A-list. Bugsy Siegel, when he got to Hollywood, 
he already knew George Raff, and George Raff took him into the studios, and he went to these Hollywood parties, and he met uh, uh, various uh, big wigs in Hollywood, and he was part of the Hollywood scene. He would party with them. Uh, ben, who had moved his wife into a, a fancy mansion in the Holmby Hills, and was the entertainment darling of Hollywood. He held parties, and Cary Grant, all the rest of them, would show up for pool parties. And Gene Hall was the godmother for his children. Imagine Bugsy walking into these Hollywood parties, the ultimate VIP. Everybody wanted to talk to him because he, he was so mysterious and he just had this charisma about him. Bugsy Siegel was a very dapper mafia guy. And uh, Hollywood women loved him. And because of that, he went to a lot of parties and met a lot of beautiful women. He knew a lot of Hollywood people. Uh, he was he was at the top of his game when he came to Los Angeles. Hollywood actually thought they saw in Bugsy Siegel a star. They they thought that Bugsy Siegel was, you know, he he was a mafia. He was everything that uh, Hollywood tried to envision when they did their movies. Bugsy Siegel was a hitman, a mafia guy. They loved it. They loved him. And the rugged gangster with baby blue eyes was an instant hit with Hollywood's leading ladies. Bugsy was confident. He was powerful. I think a lot of women love bad boys. So here's Bugsy, the Hollywood gangster, with that bad, that really bad boy image. So women flocked to him for that because he he got whatever he wanted. And there's something there's something sexy about that. He probably bought them great gifts. He had a ton of money to spend. He was very powerful. He could introduce them to celebrities. It was like being with it, the most famous person in Hollywood. They know that sticking with Bugsy, that you'll be treated like a queen. They didn't actually know that he was carrying out murders on the side, but they loved the fact that he said what he wanted to say and nobody messed with him. He was driven by power, money, status, and sex. Bugsy attracted many women, but he soon met one who would stop him in his tracks. So one day he meets this woman, Virginia Hill, who's basically Bugsy, but in female form. Uh, you don't mess with Virginia Hill. She actually comes from a mob background as well. Uh, and she really was his perfect pairing. Where to begin with Virginia? The ultimate mob mall. Uh, her real name was Uni. She had started out, uh, she came from Alabama, one of ten children, decided to escape miserable poverty. Went to Chicago, 1933, exposition there. Became friendly with a guy named Joe Epstein, who was Al Capone's chief bookie. Fabulously wealthy guy. He fixated on her. Started to give her a lot of money. Gave her a lot of money for years, just for reasons nobody quite understood, just gave her money. She in turn became a courier, very trusted courier for the mob, moved money around, some say moved drugs. Became a favorite of the Chicago mob guys, uh, with whom, most of whom she slept at one point or another. Uh, an absolute wild character, a total volcano, because she could be trusted to move money. When, when, you, when you are trusted with the mob's money, that is the ultimate trust. And the kind of woman who made her, le became a legend in the Chicago Mafia, she was a trusted mall. She was the mall who they could give money to, to be put away someplace, to be hidden, to be transferred, to whatever she had to do. And they knew to the penny she would do it. She would never take any money for herself. She would never steal. She loved that world excitement, the danger, you know, all of that stuff. She was one of these people who believed life is short and enjoy it while you can. Virginia Hill was one of the few women to ever find success in this male-dominated mob world. Uh, she's from the country, but she always wanted power and money, and she was smart, so she knew how to get it. 
1939, she moves out to Los Angeles, has dreams of becoming an actress, ha ha ha, and actually gets a screen test, which is reputedly the worst ever. That doesn't work out. But she's, you know, she's bouncing around. She knows every mobster. She knows every bad guy. And she's kind of a legend. She's a wild party girl. And she was beautiful. I mean, that's a very important part to this because she ended up using her looks to her advantage and rising within this male mob world. Uh, there's this famous story where at a Christmas party, sitting around the dinner table, she gave all the mobsters sexual favors uh, to kind of, you know, get on their good side. But she played them like fools. And then one night she meets Ben Siegel. And it's instant chemistry. Why? No one quite knows. Some say it was like two volcanoes meeting. Uh, others say they deserved each other. Others say they were made for each other. Others say, well, it's a combination of all. When Bugsy and Virginia Hill met, sparks flew. Bugsy was so intrigued by Virginia. Here is somebody who's confident, powerful, and rich, and very different than the Hollywood girls he was used to getting his way with. But at the same time, it drove him nuts because Virginia had men on the side, she did what she wanted, and she really didn't care about Bugsy that much. But there was no denying the passion between them, and that's what kept Bugsy always coming back to Virginia. So you could kind of see why Bugsy was so fascinated by her, because she was mysterious, and she knew his world, she knew his dirty secrets, and she knew how to get under his skin. In the midst of all that, his wife is further humiliated where he takes up publicly now with Virginia. He loses his head. It's the only way to describe it. Uh, pe people who watched them in action said that that's not an affair. It's a forest fire. Uh, it was by turns uh, violent and passionate. Uh, when they were together at, at the Flamingo while it was being built, uh, the staff got used to just waiting outside a room while they had an argument. And as it got more and more agitated, they would hear the sounds of breaking glass. Virginia was a thrower. She would pick up anything in the midst of an argument and throw it sometimes at Ben, sometimes not. And they would wait patiently because when the argument was over, they would then make passionate love. And then after that, the staff would come in and clean up the mess. But this was the kind of relationship they had. And it was, it was again, it was not... It was not some, it was not the kind of ordinary man-woman relationship that people were used to. It was something that went beyond that, some kind of crazy, psychotic thing. People would watch in amazement. He would take her to a, a jewelry store in Beverly Hills and buy $19,000 worth of jewelry in a day. This is in 1939. Uh, he rented out a uh, luxurious Beverly Hill mansion for her bought her a house in Miami, uh, entertained her, you know, whatever it was. She, she in turn, had money coming in, apparently, from Chicago. Uh, she was swimming in money. While Bugsy mixed with the stars and lived the high life, back in New York, special prosecutor Thomas Dewey launched a crusade against organized crime. His first high-profile hit was Bugsy's gangland boss, Lucky Luciano. Luciano was sent down on a 30 to 50 year prison sentence for being the head of a vast prostitution ring. Then the big question was after Luciano, who's next? Well, one big possibility was a flashy personality like Bugsy Siegel. As Dewey turned up the heat on the mobsters, a few threatened to turn informant. When word leaked that notorious tough guy and mob insider, Harry Big Greeny Greenberg, was going to talk, Greeny decided to go on the lam. There's a guy named Harry Greenberg, known as Big Greeny. He's an ex-Murder Incorporated guy. After Buckhalter goes on the lam, Greenberg decides, I better go on the lam too. Everybody's getting arrested. He then makes an incredible mistake. He hides out and he sends a letter, God help us, to Buckwalter saying, listen, I need $5,000 without any money. And send me the $5,000 or dangle, 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 dangle. 
well, Buckholder isn't stupid. <laughs> Figured I know what that threat is. And he says, I, he's got to be killed. He knows too much. Greenberg realizes his mistake. He goes to Los Angeles. He's hiding out there. And then he makes a second mistake. His old friend, Ben Siegel. I'll just reach out to Ben, let him know I'm here, and maybe Ben can help me out. <laughs> his childhood friend knew him very well, liked him. Everybody liked Big Greeny. He was just one of these big slob of a guys that everybody liked. The minute he told Ben where he was, that was the death warrant. So now they know where he is, it's time to kill him. Now Ben is not to be involved in this because again, he's got all these other operations. They don't want him committing a murder. They don't need that. They got people to do the murder. For reasons only known to Ben Siegel, he insists on being in on the hit team. There's two other people. Poor Big Greeny is dutifully executed. On November 22nd, 1939, Siegel and three others killed Greenberg outside his apartment. But Greeny wasn't the only mobster being encouraged to turn snitch, and Bugsy had taken a huge risk. Well, why Ben decided to participate, again, it's best known to himself, who knows, but it was an incredibly stupid move. Why? One of the hit team, he decides to flip. And he says, yeah, Ben Ben was there. He was one of the participants. Now Ben's in big trouble. That's not bad enough. Now Ben makes it worse. He gets arrested. Based on the informant's testimony, Dewey busted Bugsy with a high-profile murder rap. Chicago got nervous. A lot of people in New York got nervous. That kind of publicity is not what they were looking for. Bugsy was jailed awaiting trial. But Lucky Luciano's mafia was now so powerful that it could reach right into the heart of the U.S. prison system. He's put in jail, and he decides he wants to have a comfortable existence. First thing he does, he demands and gets the Los Angeles District Attorney to return $30,000 campaign contribution. <laughs> then he gets a setup where he has catered meals inside his prison cell. He is allowed out for dental visits. Apparently he must have had 300 cavities because he's got a lot of dental visits. And he's allowed to have women visit him in his cell. After the prosecution star witness mysteriously fell from a hotel window, Bugsy Siegel was easily acquitted. But even though he was once again a free man, he couldn't escape Hollywood gossip. Up until this point, all of his rich friends thought that he was just this fun character at a party. And then all of a sudden, this news comes out that he possibly murdered somebody, and it opened their eyes. They're like, oh my God, Like you're actually the gangster. We thought you were just pretending to be. So at this point, you know, his life was ruined in Hollywood. All of a sudden, you know, the invites dried up. Hollywood turned their back on him because they didn't actually realize they were dealing with a murderer. One of the first things that happens when he gets arrested is the Hillcrest Country Club, which is the country club for Jews in Hollywood, where he's played golf with Milton Berle and Groucho Marx and the rest of them, says, you will resign. We don't want you as a member anymore. Oh my God, he went crazy when he heard that. But it was a signal his days were over because now he was not the roguish guy in the in the in the beautiful suits you know who talked about being a hollywood actor himself someday and hung around with his friend george raft and all of that stuff now he's a pariah he's a murderer it's a very different thing there's a difference between carrying the whiff of gangland and being pinned for a very specific murder. I think Bugsy just couldn't handle that. He's used to being the life of the party. He's used to being everyone's friends, the funny guy, the charismatic guy in the room, the one who got all the ladies. And all of a sudden, that stopped, and he couldn't handle it. Bugsy was determined to show the world that the Jewish gangster raised in New York's East Side ghetto was not to be sneered at. Seeing headlines that said Bugsy drove him nuts. The nickname in Yiddish was a Vildachaya, which means a wild animal. And the American translation of that was crazy as a bedbug. 
And that's where the nickname Bugsy came from. He hated it. He wanted to be called Ben or Mr. Siegel. The level of insecurity at the core of Ben Siegel's self-esteem is a real key part to understanding him because no matter how successful they got, somebody like Ben Siegel was very, very aware that there were people looking down their nose at him. Along with his lover, Virginia Hill, Bugsy now set off on the biggest gamble of his life, a one-horse desert town that would make his name and ultimately bring about his downfall, Las Vegas. It was just a desert town, uh, pretty empty, you know, weeds overflowing. It was not the glamorous world that he's leaving behind, but he had a vision for it, and he was out to make it the next destination that he could be the king of. He wanted to bring the Hollywood glam to the desert. In the next episode. Very few people outside of Meyer, Lansky, and Siegel shared this dream. I mean, it seemed incredible, especially there in the middle of no place. But Siegel pointed out, wait a minute, it's on the main highway from California. You're going to love it. And guess what? We've made a wonderful discovery about Americans. They love to gamble. God help us, they love to gamble. But as Bugsy's vision became reality, he would lose sight of who he worked for with disastrous consequences. Bugsy was in the mob, and when you're in the mob, the mob owns you. It's not the other way around. This has been an Audio Boom original. Thanks to Hems for supporting this episode of Mafia, and be sure to check out Unexplained Mysteries from Parcast. Follow Mafia on Spotify, or rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you find your favorite shows. 